Okay, so for today, I'm going to try to speak about two things. One of them is Newton. They have some new kind of chalk, which is deliberately made so that it doesn't write. Newton's method in two complex variables. And the Ferry blow up. So, to study Newton's method in two complex variables, I'm going to specialize myself down to solving the equations f of xy is equal to y minus x squared minus a x minus y squared minus b equals 0. In other words, I'm going to be trying to do Newton's method to intersect two parabolas like that. Um, so the reason for this is because it's the simplest uh, it's the simplest case of Newton's method in two variables that I can think of. Um, it's a little bit more general than you might think. Newton's method for some function f is, of x is by always x minus the derivative of f at x inverse applied to f of x. And it is undoubtedly the most important algorithm of uh, numerical analysis. It's the one that is always used for solving equations if they aren't just sort of quadratic equations in one variable. Uh, because, and even for quadratic equations in one variable, that's what's used to compute the square root. Um, it's immensely important to try to understand the dynamics of this map. And uh, in one variable, we have a reasonably good understanding of what's going on, although even there, there still are plenty of, uh, plenty of mysteries. But in two variables, um, well, I'll tell you what I've discovered, but in no sense whatsoever can, it, can anybody claim that this is something like an adequate description. Let me just say one word about, about this uh, Newton's method in general. It has the following, suppose that f is going from some vector space E to some vector space f of the same dimension, but it's usually not a good idea to think that the domain and the range are the same space. And supposing that I have A from E to E affine, and L from F to F linear, then Newton's method for first A and then F and then L is equal to A inverse Newton's method for F A. This is the naturality of Newton's method. In particular, the linear function doesn't come into it at all. Now, the particular reason for which I want to bring this up is that this Newton's method that I'm talking about is slightly more general than you might think. You can look at these four points and look at any two conics that go through those four points. The, the solving for those two quadratic functions equal zero is exactly the same Newton map as it is for these particular two because the any the equations for any two conics going through these four points are linear combinations of these 
are the, it's a one-dimensional, it, it's a one-dimensional vector space, the vector space of functions that vanishes at these four points. Now, it's a two-dimensional vector space, but they differ by a linear transformation. And the linear transformation doesn't come into things. Now, moreover, the, if you take, therefore, the pencil of conics going through four points, that pencil of conics contains five distinguished elements and perhaps more. That pencil of conics contains two parabolas and it also contains three degenerate conics consisting of pairs of lines. And I could have used the pairs of lines rather than the conics to define my Newton's method. If you st think in terms of four points any old way and you think of the two parabolas that go through those four points, the two parabolas of the pencil of conics, then you can do an affine change of variables in the domain to put the uh, axes of these two parabolas into the directions of the standard axes of your space. And then you can do a, simil a, uh, a similarity with respect to, to both variables to force the coordinates to, to force the, the quadratic terms to be y minus x squared and x minus y squared so that actually this family of Newton's methods is the general one for intersecting any pair of conics. Okay, that's how general it is. See, this one does not move. I'll uh, switch over to here temporarily. I need, to, in order to explain what's going on, I need to do a little bit of, fund, of baby algebraic geometry to describe what's going on in these things. So here is one parabola, and here is the other parabola. One of the first things that you discover about this Newton's about the particular Newton's method that's associated to these equations, is that the lines joining pairs of roots. The lines joining pairs of roots are invariant under the Newton map. If you take a point in one of these lines, then, and you apply the Newton map, you will get another point of the same line. The line is taken to itself. And moreover, the Newton map within each line is precisely the Newton map for to solve the quadratic polynomial, which has its roots at the two points where at the two roots they, that it goes through. Now, if if you have the Newton map for if you take p of x is equal to x minus a times x minus b, and you look at the Newton map for this polynomial, it has the following dynamics, very simple dynamics. The only case this was discovered by Cayley 115 years ago or something. You have your two roots a and b. You draw the line that bisects them, and everything here is attracted to A, everything here is attracted to B. And moreover, if you make the change of variables which sends A to zero and B to infinity, the Newton map becomes just Z gives Z squared. If you take phi of Z is equal to Z minus A over Z minus B, then uh, phi inverse composed with Newton sub p composed with phi of z is equal to z squared. So the line becomes the unit circle, a becomes zero, b becomes infinity, and you can see the basins of attraction, you can, see, you can understand everything with this change of variables. And that is what is happening in each of these lines. 
Each of these lines is mapped to itself, two to one, by something which is substantially just z gives z squared. Now, you might immediately tell, discover that there, is, that there is some difficulty involved. Because how about this point, or this point, or, or that point? It's on this line, so this point wants to be attracted to this root. And it's on this line, so this point wants to be attracted to this root. And how can it simultaneously be attracted to this root and to that one? Uh, this point wants to be attracted to this root and to that root. How can it do both? Well, the, these are points of indeterminacy. They are not especially interesting points of indeterminacy. There's nothing much hiding there. One f f can understand these perfectly well. There are two more points of indeterminacy which are rather more serious. The point at infinity over there is a point of indeterminacy. And so is the one up there. Now, these, on the other hand, are phenomenally complicated. Before the lecture is out, I will have described what is hiding inside those points of indeterminacy. But let me tell you, it is complicated beyond anything that you can easily believe. And I will, uh, I, I will describe it, but it is very surprising how much structure is hiding in those points of indeterminacy. Now, another very important fact is, and what really makes the difference between studying Newton's method and studying, for instance, a Henle map, is that not only does the Newton method have point of in, points of indeterminacy, but it is not at all one-to-one, -one, and it has a critical locus. The critical locus, in this case, consists of a union of two cubics, one of which looks like something like this, Two very beautiful cubics that look something like this. That's one of them. Then there's another one. And the critical value locus, the images of these cubics, are precisely the parabolas of the, uh, precisely the parabolas of the pencil. Uh, of conics that goes through it, so precisely the parabolas that I had shown, with each cubic being a double cover of the corresponding uh, parabola, which is a rational curve, ramified at four points, which are precisely the roots, as it should happen for a cubic, which is a curve of genus one, being a double cover of a rational curve, ramified at four points, which is the way things ought to be. Now, in particular, through the point of indeterminacy up here, and through the point at ind of indeterminacy over there, there are two critical curves going through them. Uh, this conic goes through, and the other conic goes through also. Uh, this cubic goes through, and the other cubic goes through also. And that is the problem, or at least it's a large part of the problem. critical cubics go through 
the points of indeterminacy. at infinity. Now, why is this such a problem? It's because it's because blow-ups do not work so well when you have maps with critical points. If I look at the map from C2 to C2, which is given by XY, maps to x squared y. And then here I consider c2 blown up at the origin and c2 blown up at the origin. There does not exist a map f tilde which fills in the diagram. In, in algebraic geometric terms, the point is that if I blow up the origin here, here I should blow up the inverse image of the origin. And the inverse image of the origin is the subscheme of C2 defined by the equations x squared equals 0 and y equals 0. That is not the same thing as the origin defined by the equations x equals 0 and y equals 0 as far as algebraic geometry is concerned. It's a different object. And if you decide to blow up that subscheme, which you can do, you create uh, a singular surface, a cone, and then now you should start worrying about taking projective limits of these kinds of things. If every time you make blow-ups you're going to create singularities and so forth, presumably, uh, presumably this scheme is going to run into serious trouble and it's going to be very difficult to understand what you've created. <laughs> so, a scheme is a device uh, invented by, by Grotendieck, whose major purpose is to deal with, with what you, in high school you called a double point, or a double line, where singularities have coalesced. So, it turns out that as soon as the geometry of something becomes a little complicated, talking about multiplicities in terms of double this and triple that becomes inadequate. And Grotendieck figured out the, that there was a really correct way to deal with these things, which was to talk about ring spaces with, uh, uh, um, with nilpotence in the structure sheaf, and that the order of nilpotency uh, gives, allows you to, to keep track of the multiplicities of the points, even such subtle multiplicities as a surface with multiplicity 2 with a line embedded in it of multiplicity 5 with various points inside there of multiplicity 7, that there is a really clear way of dealing with these things if you allow for nilpotence in the structure sheaf. Now I am not going to give a, curve, a course about schemes, in particular as the Fary blow-up that I'm talking about here is a way of avoiding this problem completely. Uh, I am I'm scared of these spaces with nil potents, and you ought to be too, especially if you're going to think about taking projective limits of such things. And so I'm, I, I've developed an alternative way of dealing with these difficulties, which never will involve any schemes at all. But uh, could we uh, take this opportunity to say? In the growth construction, you only use commutative algorithms, right? That is true. So I'm not dealing with these horrifying non uh, non commutative uh, no, geometry say, things. Say that if you, maybe if you added graded commutative algorithms to the growth index scheme, that would be one way a mathematician could talk about Peter von Niemenhausen's Grossman variables and all that. I certainly super hope. Superspace. So superspace is a scheme probably with the graded nilpotent. Instead of just commutative notebooks, I mean that might be one. I mean, if this is really true, I sure hope that somebody's going to going to figure out exactly how to say it. Uh, I mean, I, I will be I will be immeasurably happy. <laughs> Then if I might put in a proposal, could the, could the physicist or the mathematical physicist please put it in this language so that I can understand what they're talking about? No, why should that be? Because I want to understand what they're talking about. Okay.
Yeah, absolutely. Though, though in, in fact, it is not. It's a Swiss high school, but equations have equations having double roots, and therefore the double root counting is a double point is something which certainly came up in high school when I was there, and I think it still does. You're still doing it. I'm still doing it. <laughs> I mean, we talked about double roots and thought of them as being somehow two points on top of each other all the time, didn't you? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so there will be immense trouble, at least I think there will be immense trouble. For five years I tried to, to, to define these things as complicated schemes, and then I found an alternative. Now, whether you're going to think that this alternative really represents an improvement is, is up to you. But I'm, I'm going, I think it is, I think it creates something which is just beautiful. And moreover, so I'm going to define a new kind of blow-up. This blow-up is somehow, of course, infinitely more complicated than the, the, than the ordinary blow-up that, that, that I talked about yesterday. But still, well, I hope you like it. I think it will turn out to be a fundamental construction for all of dynamics in several variables, the Fary blow-up. So let me tell you what the Fary blow-up is. And then I will apply the Fary blow-up to the points at infinity of the Newton map to show you what's hiding there. The data for a Fary blow-up Well, maybe I shouldn't be in a rush, and I ought to show you some, a few computer pictures just to keep a feeling of reality that these are objects that really, that really exist. And let me see, Newton real. Is there a Newton real here? Newton real. Let me see, there's something funny about this. Uh, perhaps minus two to two would be better, minus three to three. Minus three to three, minus three to three. Mm. Okay, here is what the decomposition of R2 is when you try to do the Newton's method for conics which intersect at the following four points. The points are 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and the point whose two coordinates you see here, 2 and point 2. I'll be glad to just change those and put them to something else, perhaps 2 and 3. So you have four basins, as you might imagine, they're colored in red for the basin of zero, zero, blue for the basin of zero, one, green for the basin of one, zero, and gray for the basin of two, three. You can see the line joining the two roots zero, zero, and one zero, which is just the x-axis. And if you look at it carefully, you will see that it is, in fact, let me just put in that line so that you can see it better. There it is, it's the x-axis now. You can see it is entirely re red until you arrive here, and then it's entirely green. Now, it's entirely red, but it has to be pretty careful about it to be entirely red. And you can see that there is a, there are, the points of indeterminacy are here and then they have inverse images. And there are points of indeterminacy here and they have inverse images. The same is the case of the uh, jo line joining the basin 0, 0 to the basin of 0, 1, which is all blue until it gets here and red here. And the same thing holds for this line. Uh, which joins these two, and so forth. There's some fairly complicated structure around places like this, which I kind of understand sometimes. You said that the intersection of these two lines is a point of indeterminacy, but it seems very red. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I see. Uh, 
Let me see. Um, no, that, that's one of the roots. I'm sorry. They, uh, the points of intersection, you have a quadrilateral formed of the formed out of the lines joining the pairs of roots and then the, dia the places where the diagonals intersect are points of indeterminacy. Uh, and you can see the, the kind of structure which is sitting in here uh, you have a point of indeterminacy in all of its inverse images or the structure that's sitting in here is much the same. Uh, there, there's all kinds of complicated structure in here. So where are the points of indeterminacy? Say it again. Where are the points of indeterminacy? So there's a point of indeterminacy here. There's a point of indeterminacy here. Uh, there's a point of indeterminacy right here in the middle, which is at the intersection of this diagonal with that diagonal. In the point of indeterminacy right in the middle, we can go and look at it more carefully. Okay, if one takes complex slices, one gets pictures which as always when you take complex slices look completely different from anything that you produce in real slices. Uh, in the complex, this represents some cut. I could tell you exactly which one, but it would not be in immensely inspiring. Uh, through, through C2, in which there are still four basins, they're colored in four colors. This is how that particular slice ha happens to intersect. And there's all kinds of entertaining structure. I maybe perhaps will not make very many more blow-ups. And the object of my exercise is try to understand a picture like this. But I'm very far from succeeding. Okay. So the main tool that I have to propose in trying to understand this is something which I call the Fary blow up. The data of a Fary blow up is a point in a surface with two curves intersecting at, at that point with uh, smoothly and with distinct tangents. And the model that I will be wor always working with is C2 and the, the axes x equals 0, y equals 0. And the process that I'm going to do is to blow up this point and then blow up these two points and then blow up those four points, and so forth. Over and over and over, blowing up all the double points that I see and taking the projective limit of the structures in question. Now, let me label these... Let me label these... Uh, the, the curves that I get. So this curve, I'm going to label 1, 0. And this curve, I'm going to label 0, 1. I have reasons for these labels, which is that if I consider t to the 1, t to the 0, and then I take the limit as t goes to 0, that gives me a straight line, which you will observe the y-coordinate being constantly 1, goes to the point, uh, the point 0, 1. And more generally, I'm going to want to consider t goes to t to the p, t to the q, and look at the end of this line as t goes to zero as labeling some particular component. 
So that this one is called 1, 1. This one was 1, 0, and this one was 0, 1. Then this one is 1, 0. This one is 0, 1. This one is still 1, 1. But this one, as it turns out, is 2, 1. And this one is 1, 2. And more generally, uh, I'm going to label things by the process of Fary addition according to the Fary tree 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, uh, 3, 2, 2, 3, uh, 1, 3, and so forth. In the process of writing these numbers, I create in the first quadrant, I will name every element of Z2 cross Z2, uh, of Z cross Z in the first quadrant, whose coordinates are coprime. The primitive points of the, uh, in the first quadrant. So here's 1, 1, here is 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 3. 2, 2 will never show up, but 2, 3 will, and, three, and 2, 3 will, and so forth. Now, there are two things to be said. So th this is a specific procedure for co performing infinitely many blow-ups. And moreover, um, it has the interesting property that if you take the curve t gives t to the p, t to the q, and if you've made enough blow-ups so that the pair pq actually appears, then the curve, the genuine curve, which exists in, in C2, t gives t to the p, t to the q, will land right in the middle of the pq component, which makes the labeling reasonable. Now, what am I going to see if I go to the projective limit? Well, I'm going to see this picture. All the lines will be there. Uh, here is 1, 0, there is 0, 1, here is 1, 1, here is 2, 1, here is 1, 2, here is uh, 3, 1, here is uh, uh, 3, 2, and so forth. All the lines will be there, but they no longer intersect. There is now, in addition, a counter set a cantor set of bad points corresponding to the irrationals. And if you took the curve t gives t, t to the square root of 2, and you were to follow it down to t equals 0, that curve would go straight to some bad point, some irrational point of this sequence. Now, you might think that all that I've done is created something horrible. So let me try to show you that there's some geometric structure associated to this, to this, uh, to this fairy blow-up, which is extraordinarily reminiscent of the KAM theorem. Can I ask a question at this point? Hey, I have works like what you said up as sort of a purely algebraic Thing that's going to be Galois invariant. What's the meaning of p square root of 2 in a purely algebraic? Is it just that you can't, you can't say that this curve lands there and that point itself is still labeled by square root of 2? The topology is a Galois invariant. I know the topology, but where is the topology? When you say blow up, you know, are you really taking the topology seriously yet? I guess the Cantor set part. 
I couldn't say that I have actually understood what your question is asking. Okay. Um, <laughs> but maybe, maybe Kurt has and would like to answer. Kurt, have you? I think he wants to know, you know, how do you, it looks like everything you did is defined over the rational numbers. So how does this uh, often know the difference between square root of 2 and minus square root of 2? So, I'm sorry to say that I haven't genuinely thought about this. It, it is true that the Fary blow up is an object of pro algebraic geometry over Z. And therefore, that there really should be a Galois action on this thing. And I've never thought about it, and I don't think I'm going to invent that theory right here as I was standing on my feet. Um, but it, seems, it strikes me as indeed probably well worth trying to understand trying to understand what the answer to your question is, but I just don't know. Let me tell you what I do know. So let us go back to what I had called the real oriented blow up yesterday, which is another way of saying, what would you see in a little tubular neighborhood of this object? Well. A, the, a tubular neighborhood of this object, something like this, all the blow-ups happened inside, so in its overall structure, you can just think that it's this little three-sphere. The little three-sphere around the origin in C2. Now let's try to figure out what we see in this as we do successive blow-ups. When we start, what we see in this three-sphere are the lines through the origin giving you where each line intersects a three sphere in a circle. These circles are linked with linking number one or perhaps minus one, it depends on your orientation conventions. And uh, they form the Hopf vibration of the three sphere. And I am, like yesterday, going to draw the Hopf vibration, or rather two fibers of the Hopf vibration the fibers corresponding to the x-axis and to the y-axis. When you do the first blow-up, and it's actually easier to understand what happens for the first blow-up than it is uh, after the first blow-up is performed, you acquire a torus. Well, actually you acquire two tori. Don't forget that after the first blow-up, you acquire two tori. And I'm going to think of one of these tori as a little torus uh, I think maybe I'll start my drawing over again and draw these two tori. You have two solid tori, one like this, one like this. Or each one of these tori is filled, is, is foliated by circles, the circles in question being the inverse images of individual points. And inside here, you have the curves that are going around like this. Inside here, you have the curves that are just going through like this. And in the outside, you still have the Hopf vibration of curves which are 1-1 one, one curves. Now, when I blow this up, what is going to happen? I'm going to be thickening one of these two tori, say this one. I'll imagine thickening it like this. And this, this region is still going to have one zero curves. This region is going to have two one curves. This one has one one curves. Then I also am going to, since I'm, I'm performing these blow-ups, 
I'm also going to be creating an extra torus, thickening this torus and looking at the zone between the two tori that I've created. Here, this one filled with 1, 2 curves and this one still cur filled with 0, 1 curves. Now, successively and over and over, I'm going to thicken all the tori that you see and fill the thickened zone with curves of the form PQ where P is P1 plus P2 and Q is Q1 plus Q2. Q1, P1 and Q1, P2 and Q2 corresponding to the curves that bounded the zone around the torus that, that I just thickened. So for instance, next time when I thicken this one, so that will create an extra torus sitting inside here like this, the zone that's going to be in between those two, this is now going to go to there, this zone is going to be the sum of these two, 3, 2. And in the limit, what you are going to get is a picture which is very familiar to people who have studied the KAM theorem, although it's combinatorial and somehow much simpler, you're going to have a Cantor set worth of tori The Cantor set being, the tori being labeled by the irrationals and corresponding to the bad points of this picture and then zones corresponding to all the rational numbers so Cantor, it's hard to draw a Cantor set of circles but I, I'm doing my best And the zones in question, the ones corresponding to the rational number PQ, being filled with PQ torus knots. So the claim is that the real oriented blow up of the Fary blow up is this picture very familiar from, from um, the KAM theorem of the three sphere filled up with tori with irrational foliations. They correspond to the rational numbers and each one is foliated with the corresponding irrational slope. And zones corresponding to all the rational numbers, each one being filled, the one corresponding to the rational number PQ, rational vector PQ being filled with PQ torus knots. Really, I think, an extremely attractive picture revealing that these bad points aren't so bad. Yesterday, when talking about uh, the Henno map, the bad point corresponded to a solenoid. Here, it corresponds to something more civilized. It corresponds just to a plain old torus. But what's bad about it, what's irrational about it, is the slope of the foliation by which it's being, uh, which is foliating it. And of course, by the very way things are constructed, the torus knots in successive zones that are approximating a given irrational, those torus knots are getting longer and longer and more complicated and approximating the irrational foliation of the corresponding torus. So this is my, I started saying I was going to do Fary blow-ups. The data for a Fary blow-up is a point of a surface and two curves going through that point. If you have that, you can do this entire procedure, blow up the double point, blow up the double points you see, blow up the double points you see, and so forth. You will create, you will create this way a, a something or other, a pro-algebraic variety or something a projective limit of algebraic varieties. In the complex world, it contains various copies of the projective 
uh, of the projective plane, of the projective line, each with two, two bad points on it, and then it contains a Cantor set's worth of, uh, of non-algebraic, of non-smooth points. But one can really understand what the structure is if you look at this from outside. So in other words, if you put yourself in the boundary of a tubular neighborhood, what you will see is not nearly so bad. It will just be the standard sort of combinatorial KM picture of a Cantor set of tori with irrational foliations and zones corresponding to all the rational numbers foliated by torus knots. Yes? No, I think it's a continuous foliation, sure. In fact, I'm sure it's a continuous foliation. No problem. Let me tell you one rather interesting thing, which I don't actually know how to apply it, but I can't help but feel that it is really it's too, it's too surprising and, and too, too pretty for it possibly to be just a fluke. Which is, you can, I can take C2, blow up of C2 at the origin. This isn't quite complete, real oriented blow up. And I'm going to put a star here. Star means I'm going to take out all the bad points. And then I want to look at H2 of this object. H2 with coefficients, well, we'll see what I want, what I want for coefficients. Alternately, you can talk about H2 upstairs of the whole thing. And these two things are isomorphic because each one of these is, the whole space is a projective limit. On the basis of cohomology, that becomes an inductive limit. This is an inductive limit of exactly the same objects where I take out the bad points at each stage. I take out the double points at each stage and then each one is included in the, in the next. Uh, once I've taken out the double points, I can include each one in the next and then I can take the inductive limit anyway. So here are spaces. My claim is that these spaces actually really want to be Hilbert spaces. They want to be Hilbert spaces because they have a natural inner product, the inner product coming from the intersection form viewed on here, or as the cup product viewed in here. And um, one wishes to try to understand these spaces with their inner product as Hilbert spaces. Now here is my, my assertion. These spaces are naturally, now there's an unfortunate uh, fact that the H1 space of Sobolev uses the same letter H as the H2 space of, uh, as the H2 of homology or the H of cohomology. These spaces are naturally H1 of the interval. H1 being the Sobolev H1 of functions whose derivatives are square integrable. With the Fary Har basis. Okay, so this requires a bit of explanation. First, I want to tell you about what I mean. So, H1 of I will be by definition the space of functions f from 0, 1 to R with um, f of 0 equals f of 1 equals 0 and the integral of f prime of t in absolute value squared dt from 0 to 1 finite. This is a famous Hilbert space 
which uh, people who do partial differential equations view as the, 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 the first serious Hilbert space which occurs. I mean, th this, is the th this is the space in which one studies the theory of the Laplacian and so forth. I mean, after all, you have to integrate the gradient squared of functions in order to get the, hey, the action that we were talking about. You remember that integral of phi, prime, uh, phi dot squared from this morning? You can see that if you really want to do, to have uh, a wave functions phi on which that action is well defined, you're going to have to put them in H1. What about the second term? <laughs> The lambda lambda dot, huh? Okay, okay. I'm afraid that I, I'm afraid I don't know how to answer that. But in any case, the first term. Hey, I've actually established a connection with the previous lecture. I find that quite astonishing in itself. <laughs> so, what is the Fari Har basis of this? Supposing I take some primitive point, PQ, is equal to P1 plus P2, Q1 plus Q2 in Z2 first quadrant, I don't know, intersect the first quadrant. So here is PQ. Here is P1, Q1, and here is P2, Q2. Now look at the piecewise linear function on the quadrant, which is 1 here, 0 here, 0 here, 0 on all of this. And other than that, it's linear except on those lines. You can imagine there's some sort of tent that goes up like this. Intersect that with the line which joins 1, 0 to 0, 1. You will get some function like this. Where 0 and 1 is, say, the x-axis, the x-coordinate parametrizing this line segment. These functions, I claim, form a basis of H1, form a Hilbert basis of, an orthonormal Hilbert basis of H1. This thing called EPQ form a Hilbert basis, an orthonormal Hilbert basis of H1. This is a rather entertaining, completely elementary fact in its own right. Very analogous to the Haar basis. If you start thinking of what the derivative of this is, the derivative of this is something positive and then something negative, very much like a Haar function. And it just so happens that the square of this, you integrate it, you will get 1. I'm not in R3. This is R2. What? what, what? Um, so, I'm, I'm using as my reference for this, this line. This line is really a, a description of a part of the real projective, uh, real projective line. It's a set, set of slopes. There is a way of making all of this uh, independent of which section you're using and so forth. Have I answered your question? But it really is true if you take this, this function, which of course lives in R3, this function, uh, which is it's zero here, then, it ha then it's some, some plane here, some plane here, zero here, its value is one there, zero here and zero here, that specifies it completely. And you 
intersect it with the vertical plane through here to see it as a graph of a function of one variable, it really will become a tent function. It will become a fairy tent function. It's not obvious, but it's a little elementary computation, to check that these things actually form a natural basis, orthonormal basis, of H1. It's really true. And uh, now, where do I see these objects in the homology of the Ferry blow up? Well, or in the cohomology. I, I'm aware that Milner thinks I should be working in the, in the cohomology, and he might be right, but somehow I feel more comfortable. I, he came over the other day and told me, why don't you like Hilbert Czech cohomology? What's wrong with Czech cohomology? And he's, he's of course right. But I, I feel, find it a little bit easier to think in the homology. So supposing that I've done a certain number of blow-ups. So what kind of homology is this? Uh, there's no question it's a manifold. I took out the bad points. I took out the bad points for the homology. So there's no question as to what it is. Uh, there's only one homology theory for manifolds. If I had left the bad points in, I'd really have to tell you about it. But, I, but as it turns out, I don't need to. Now, supposing that here is old PQ, and it was just created right now. It didn't exist last time. Here's P1, Q1. Here's P2, Q2. And they were just created. Now, this thing here is a sphere. But the problem is, I can't go on talking about this sphere after I do the blow-up next time. So what I'm going to do instead is that I'm going to deform this sphere slightly so that it misses the double points. This curve, this deformed sphere, the sphere which I jiggled a little bit to, to miss the bad points, it goes right on existing and becomes an honest-to-God curve someplace in here. It's a sphere here, and the blow-ups are never going to happen at a point of the sphere, so it goes right on existing in the final space. Okay, so the homology class, EPQ, is the homology class, homology class of this sphere. It's a two-dimensional sphere. It's a projective, it's a complex projective line when you see it here. After you've deformed it a little bit to miss those points, it's just a differentiable or a topological sphere. But it has a fundamental class anyway, which gives you an element of H2 of this space. But H2 of this, but since I've taken these points out, it goes right on existing all the way to the projective limit. So that's EPQ. Now the next question is, why is this EPQ, why is this EPQ that function? Well, for the following reason. This homology, H2 of the uh, real oriented blow up of this Fary blow up, uh, gosh, the Fary blow up of C2 at the origin. This is naturally sitting inside Z to the irreducible components of the Fary divisor. In other words, if you take a, homo a homology class, it still is a superposition of these points with weights. You can still think of it as a superposition of these spheres with weights. Because at every stage of the inductive limit, it is sitting, it is sitting inside the, the spheres that have been developed so far with weights. And then in the projective limit, it gives something or other. 
In other words, I really can think of it as some function waits on all of these points. Now you might think that obviously it's just one here and zero every place else, but that's not true. You see, if instead of deforming this the first time, I'd left it to go through these points, then next time around, it would become it would become this one plus this one plus this one. So it would acquire weight 1, 1, and 1. Then the time after that, when you started blowing up these points, you'd get 1, 2, 2, 2, and so forth. You, you'll get more weights, which are in fact just the weights of just adding 0 here and 1 here and thinking of the linear function that you get in, this, in, the, in these two places. In other words, you really are not going to get just sort of a delta function here. You really are going to get something linear and something linear here. Uh, as sitting inside z to the irreducible, just assigning weights to all, the, to all the primitive points inside here, the function that you're going to get is precisely going to be linear on this sector, linear on this sector, zero there. In other words, it's going to become this function. Okay, well, you know what? My time is up for, for, for Fary Bleu for today. Um, but I've told you something. Well, th let me tell you just one, one more thing. The one more thing is that when I now want to do Newton's method, when I want to do Newton's method and I want to resolve the singularities that are sitting at the, on the ends of the axes, i.e. on the axes of the parabolas at infinity, because of these critical curves that are going through here, I can't just blow up and then blow up the inverse images and so forth because the map doesn't extend after I've done a blow up because of the critical points. But if I perform a Fary blow up here and a Fary blow up there, then the map does extend. In other words, the Fary blow up is the way to try to describe uh, uh, the, the Fary blow-up is the blow-up which is well behaved with respect to maps with critical points. Uh, the, the, the map xy maps to x to the p, y to the q for any p's and q's. This map from c2 to c2 does extend to the Fary blow-up uh, that map F, if I take the Fary blow up of C2 at the origin and the Fary blow up of C2 at the origin, there is a lifting here, even though there was no lifting of the original, uh, even though there was no lifting to any finite level of blow up. At the infinite level of blow up, there is one. And the Fary blow-up has the flexibility that it allows you to, uh, to, to remove points of, of indeterminacy even when these points of indeterminacy are intersections of critical curves, almost arbitrarily. And as a result of this flexibility, uh, I think one should think of the Fary blow-up as a new kind of blow-up that it will, should be used systematically any time one is doing dynamics in two variables. And there is a critical locus that that, that is the only reasonable tool to work with which will actually work, it, which, which really will work and which keeps you in spaces that are at least understandable, spaces which have this sort of KM structure with infinitely many tori. And next time I will work out the details of what this gives and also how then the Newton map acts on the, on the homology. After all, the name of the game in dynamics is to try to do spectral theory 
on the uh, on the operation of the uh, map on the Hilbert space of cohomology, or at least that's what I'm proposing to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>